Thank you all so much. Thank you, Tim. That was great, as always. Appreciate it so much. Thank you all for sharing your testimonies. These words of encouragement. You know, I mean, these things, God is not a respecter of person. So, what He's done for this couple uh, in Carlisle, what He did for Jane, He's willing to do that to anybody who will believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's available. It's just a question of us putting our faith where it needs to be and then standing on that. Yeah. And so He makes all things new. Praise the Lord. Yeah. In Jesus' name. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne and Peter, for leading us in worship. Thank all of you for sharing your testimonies and prayer requests. Be sure to let us know when God answers. We'd like, to, we'd like to, the testimonies to go with those as well. So, and we know that he is moving in everybody's life. We just have to stay focused on him and uh, not just the situations. Praise the Lord. So uh, thank you, Mike and Suzanne, as always, for taking care of everything. Uh, dealing with all the technical issues. We appreciate it so much. And uh, for all of you that are here today, God bless you. To all of you that are joining us on Facebook and online, we appreciate you being part of the service this morning, and you certainly are. Uh, wherever you're at, uh, when you join with us in the spirit, God is one with us and, and ministers wherever you are geographically. It doesn't change a thing. God is not in distance. Amen. He doesn't deal with uh, space and time the way we think of it. So he's wherever you are in the midst of us and blessing us with his uh, power and his peace and his forever love, his eternal love. Praise you, God. So God bless you again. Thank you all for being with us. It's Palm Sunday. And of course, next Sunday is going to be Easter. I think we'll probably take communion. And I'm hoping, and I hope that you'll be praying with me, uh, that we will be opening back up for Sunday school and uh, the small kids and so forth uh, within the next month is my expectation and my hope. And I'm just, you know, I'm tired of being told what we can do and what we can't do. That's our intention, and uh, God willing, and I know he is, that's what we'll do. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody said that Tim's talking about this quite a bit, about being worthless. I was called a lot of things as a kid, and most of it was deserved, probably. Yeah. But, you know, I can remember uh, someone said I was completely worthless. But being the positive person that I am, I just said, well, I can always serve as a bad example. Lemons into lemonade, right? Praise the Lord. How long is a Chinese name? That's right. Uh, I know, I'm probably in trouble now because I've said something about an, an Asian, but I hear something about white people all the time, too, you know, and so it's, it's the way it goes. I have no animosity towards any race, creed, color, ethnicity. I just think sometimes things are funny. Praise the Lord. And how long is a Chinese name? That's all I have to say. Praise the Lord. And I, you know, so I'll just be honest with you, I have an inferiority complex, but it's not a very good one. <laughs> I'm just left a lot of private things out of the box this morning. You know, I like to hold hands for the movies, which always seems to startle strangers. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is good, is he? Praise yeah. the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let's go to the Word of God this morning. I want to start uh, with Colossians chapter 2, and we'll read verses 8 through 23, Peter. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 23. And thanks again for everybody joining us here this morning. Uh, finally, we have a sunshiny day in uh, yeah. the middle of Iowa, at least, and uh, we're grateful for that. And uh, it's good to see the sun again. Pressing after a while when you get clouds and rain day after day after day for a week up at a time. So the sun shines a blessing today for us. Praise the Lord. All right, Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, where also ye are risen with him through the faith of the 
operation of God who had raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have been quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of it openly, triumphing over the men. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Praise the Lord. So Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, which is that entire chapter, Peter. Hebrews 8, 1 through 13. Now other things which we have spoken, this is the sum. This is the, the point. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord fish and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have someone also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to law who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for. See, saith he, that thou makest all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now have he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Mm -hmm. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God. And they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that, he said, a new covenant. He hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, God has revealed himself in history. And first, it was through the, the natural, physical shadows uh, that pointed to a spiritual substance, and then through the revelation of the substance itself in the physical form. Okay? Let me, let me repeat that. He, he, he points to the spiritual substance with shadows. He points to spiritual substance. And then through the revelation of that substance, it comes into a physical form. It, it manifests, in other words, in a, in a way that we can uh, identify with it as human beings, all right? So the central figure of all of the biblical history is Jesus. Amen? We talked about this some last week, but he is the sum of all spiritual goodness, period. Amen? The fullness of the Godhead, the Bible says. Amen? He is the fullness of the Godhead incarnated in a natural, physical form. Praise the Lord. And the result is, anybody who is going to perceive life as it really is, as it truly is, will have to see it by embracing Jesus as the substance of every shadow of revelation.
revelation throughout history. Praise the Lord. The blood on the doorpost of Israel in Egypt, it was a shadow. Yes. Now it happened. It was a physical thing that took place, but it was a shadow pointing to a spiritual truth. Amen? And so was the blood of animal sacrifices offered as sin offerings. The substance was the blood of Jesus for our redemption. Yes. Amen? When Israel was in the wilderness and they were being bitten by snakes because of their rebellion, amen, God told them to put a serpent on a pole. If they would look at the serpent, they would be healed. Now think about this. That serpent was a shadow, and the substance was Jesus on the cross. Now does that make sense, though? This was a serpent. What is the serpent? Evil. Jesus bore all the evil, all of the sin. And if we looked at him, he takes our sin away. Just as he took away the poison of the snakes when they looked upon the serpent. It was a type. It was a shadow. The serpent was a shadow, and the substance was Jesus on the cross. Yes. Amen. God met with Moses on Mount Sinai, and he gave him the law. What Moses brought down from the mountain was a shadow of righteousness in the Ten Commandments. It was a shadow. It was never, it was never for man to be able to do that. It was a shadow of what man could be in Christ. Righteous. But they couldn't do it by keeping those rules. The rules were there to show them their inability to keep them, right? right? Jesus is the substance of righteousness. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. God instituted, think about the priesthood. And he, he, so he initiated that uh, for Israel. And it was a shadow of the eternal intercession of Jesus for us, for mankind. As the priest would offer up sacrifices and intercede on behalf of the people, that was a shadow of what Jesus has done. Praise the Lord. The Temple of Sodom. Those of you who come out of the UPC, we've had a lot of studies on the, on the tabernacle and the, how it represented uh, and shadowed different realities of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. So the Temple of Sodom was a shadow of the body of Christ. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And the nation of Israel, now think about this. I'm not saying Israel, God isn't going to redeem the the. the uh, what do you call it, the uh, remnant of Israel. But he's not dealing with Israel right now except as they come to Christ. Right? So the, the nation of Israel was a shadow according to the nation of believers who were to be God's eternal people and his eternal dwelling place. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Now all these shadows are useful. They're important because they help us understand some things about spiritual reality if we'll look at them in the right way. Praise the Lord. They give us clues to what the substance is really like, which is something that Israel never grasped under the Old Covenant. Right. So the problem comes when we forget that shadows are not substance. Right. They're just shadows. Mm -hmm. I know when you're a little kid, you see the shadow, it can really freak you out, but the shadow is not the issue. It's whatever's making that shadow <laughs> is what you've got to be concerned about. Praise the Lord. So the Christians in, in Colossus, which we read uh, initially, uh, in, in Colossians, that Paul was talking to in that day did exactly that. For example, when they got too hung up on the observances of particular rituals and rites and, and what this one believed or that one believed, and, and particular rituals and so forth, Paul warned them, look at this again in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. They were, they were arguing and fussing over, you know, should we having service on this day, on that day, on Saturday, on Sunday, on, you know, just all of these arguments. Let no man therefore judge me in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days. Paul was talking to these Christians. Amen? Doesn't, doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, we've got religious people still arguing about celebrating the Sabbath on Saturday or on Sunday, in the morning, at night, Fridays, Wednesdays, right? What, what rituals should we observe? Should we be formal about it? Should we be informal? Should we be relaxed? Should we use wine or should we use grape juice? Right? Crackers or unleavened bread? I mean, seriously, there's a, there are arguments about these things. I see them on the internet all the time. I even get messages about them. But, praise the Lord, you're wasting your time. But the righteous, what, what should the righteous eat? Should they eat pork? Should they even eat meat? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a veg 
vegetarian because I hate animals. I'm a vegetarian because I hate plants. Amen. I'm not a vegetarian, I'm just saying. <laughs> if I were. Yeah. But, you know, should we drink alcohol? Should we wear jeans? What about shorts? T-shirts when you come to church. What about short hair? What about long hair? What about beards? <laughs> All these arguments are about shadows. Yes. They're not about substance. Yes. When we let ourselves get caught up in the in, in all of these areas, where, where we let our focus move from the spirit to the natural, it always shifts from the spiritual to the point where all we see is the natural. Now, I don't want to, I'm not going to get down on where I came from in terms of religion and so on and so forth, but I'm going to tell you, in some churches where there, where there is such a focus on the external, it's hard to get focused on the spirit. Mm -hmm. Because you find you're either being judged or you're judging. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Those red toenails, that can't be right. <laughs> Open toe shoes. I don't have a foot fetish, so it didn't bother me. But some people, that might have been a big deal. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But anyhow, you know, that's what I'm saying. When, once, we, once we move from our attention being on God and on the spiritual, we, we automatically shift our focus to the external, to the physical, to the to the shadow rather than the substance. Amen? We lose sight of the fact that God has always done things in the spiritual. He doesn't. What happens, the manifestation that comes in the flesh is the last thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's already done it. But it's been done in the spirit. That's where our focus has to be. By his stripes, you were healed. That's the focus that had to be on these people. Amen? That God healed. It couldn't be on my sickness, on my disease, because the doctors are telling me there's no cure. But God has said, by his stripes, you were healed already. Yes, yes. Amen. God's people have always been essentially spiritual people. Amen. And that's what was happening. Look at this in Acts chapter 21. And I want to read verses 24 through 28. Acts 21, verses 24 through charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning me are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. They were making a dedication of something, for something. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from the things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. So Paul's talking to these Jews, but he's saying, no, we're not. Okay, this is your tradition. Fine. But we're not going to demand this of the Gentiles because they have no part in it. There's no reason for them to even participate in it or feel obligated to. Then Paul took them in, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia... When they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. In other words, they, they didn't lay hands on him to be healed. They laid hands on him to whip him. Crying out, men of Israel, help. This is a man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, the temple. And further, brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Praise the Lord. So they're accusing Paul. They're, they're irate. They're just hostile about the whole thing. And why were they so upset? Was he really preaching against them as a people? Or was he really preaching against the law? Or against the temple? No, he wasn't preaching against any of them. Look at Romans 9 and verse 3. Paul was not against Jewish people. In fact, the scripture says, he said, I, I gladly give my life if they could be saved, if they would be saved. For I would uh, could wish that myself were cursed for Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, for them, for their sake. Amen? So Paul wasn't against Jewish people. Paul's point was 
simply that the natural Jew is not the central issue in God's plan. And that ticked them off. Amen. Look at Galatians, look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Just a couple of examples here, real quick. Galatians 3, 6 through 8. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of the faith, the same are the children of Abraham. We have Abraham to our father, they would say. And he's telling them, no, it's the people that have faith are actually the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And look at Galatians 4, verses 21 through 30. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which generates the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answer to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath her husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, and even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Praise the Lord. So here's what the whole point of this is. Faith is not uh, faith, not genealogy, is the birthmark, amen, of God. Amen. Faith, not genealogy, not where you came from, not your history, not your ancestry, but your faith. Yeah. That's the birthmark God puts on you to define you as his child. Amen? So we're, we're not physically the genealogy, or possibly we could be, but for the most part, we're not the, the uh, genealogy of Abraham, physically speaking, DNA. But we are of faith, which is how God identified him, because he was not a Jew at the time God spoke to him initially. He had not crossed over and and became the first Hebrew. He was just like one of us. He was a Gentile. Praise the Lord. So he covers both sides of this thing. But it's all done the same way, by faith. Whether Jew or Gentile, you come to Jesus one way, and that's by faith. The physical nation of Israel was chosen by God for what? To be a shadow. Praise the Lord. To point toward what the spiritual people of God were to be like. Separated. Not, not externally. But to God, to be his people, to be his offspring. Amen? But the Jews of Paul's day, they refused to see it. They would not acknowledge it. And that's why they accused Paul of preaching against our people. I mean, they hated the Gentiles who were dogs. They hated them. These Greeks, you let these people into the temple, they polluted the temple now. You know? Praise the Lord. And, okay, so the second accusation was... He was preaching against Jewish law, or the law of Moses, right? That's not true either. Paul stressed again and again, you can look at it over and over in the New Testament, that the, the, the law is righteous, the law is good, the law is holy. It'll never be abolished. Amen? But he also stressed the purpose of the law is to expose the spiritual reality of human sin. It was never intended to make people righteous. Praise the Lord. Jesus came to show us the essence of righteousness. Yes. Yes. Amen. The spiritual reality that far transcends the letter of the law. I mean, think about it. The people who were crucifying him, I mean, there was everybody was involved. The, the, the ones who cried out for his blood were Jews. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Anyone who believes that righteousness is some behavioral pattern has given their lives to shadows and not substance. Yes. 
It doesn't mean we're not to be moral people and decent, God-fearing people. You know what I mean by that. But, it, what it, but what it means is that we're not judged, we're not uh, critiqued by our behavior from God, but by our faith in what he has already done. That's what this world needs to know. Because they're struggling, man. I mean, the people are trying hard to be better, only to find themselves being worse. Like Paul says, the harder I try, the better to be, the worse I am. And that's true when we try to do it in ourselves. We fail. Because we're trying to make a substance out of a shadow. Mm -hmm. When it's the substance we're supposed to be looking for, which is Jesus. Yes. The third accusation the Jews made against Paul was that he preached against the temple. He didn't. But he did say the temple in Jerusalem was not God's holy place. He didn't preach against it. They purified themselves and went to the temple and went through the ritual that the Jews used for purification for whatever situation that it was they were dealing with. So he honored that ritual, but he just said, now, don't hold this up on the Gentiles. We don't put this weight on them because they don't have to do any of this stuff. This is a ritual. This is a tradition, right? So he said, Jerusalem is not God's holy place. It's a shadow of God's holy place. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. That's the substance. The shadow was the original temples. Mm -hmm. We're all pointing to Jesus. We've already talked about some of that. All right? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. Colossians 1, 24 through 27. Whom the Son sets free on is free indeed. And that's what he's after, to set us free so that we can love him and serve him from love, not from fear, not from dread of punishment or, uh, you know, some sort of retribution. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I have made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The dwelling place of God, the temple of God. Yes. Know ye not, you are the temple of the living God, right? Yes. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. First Peter 2, 4 through 7. Praise the Lord. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Amen. Unto you, therefore, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient or unbelieving, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. In its day, Solomon's temple was, it, it expressed the majesty, the beauty, the glory, the, the, the physical uh, beauty of God. In a physical way. They did it in a way to everything, all the gold, everything they did was to try to, to amplify God's glory, God's goodness, God's mercy. It was a it was a physical way of doing that. Alright? The church, which is the substance, that was the shadow. The church, which is the substance, is to manifest the glory of God for all of eternity. That's what the scripture says. We do that by existing. 
by showing God's mercy, by, by receiving that mercy, that grace, and that goodness, by the healings, by the deliverance, by the breakthroughs, and others see the glory of God. They see the reality of God in us, not in a building somewhere. Right. As beautiful as the building is, it's still just a building. But this is a dwelling place for God Almighty. Mm -hmm. This is the substance of what that building was trying to portray. Mm -hmm. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 22 through 24, Peter. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. But you are come unto Mount Zion, under the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Mm -hmm. Praise God. We are like Abraham. We're stuck here in a natural world. But we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. We're looking for the reality of God in his church and his people. Mm -hmm. hey, look at Hebrews 11.10. Hebrews 11.10. Hebrews 11.10. Abraham was the shadow pointing to the church. He, he looked for a city which had foundations, but whose builder and maker was God. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone foundation. All of that. Amen? We're the people of the Spirit. The invisible spiritual world is not only real, it actually controls the more apparent physical world that we walk around in every day. Amen? We have to refuse to live only in shadows. That's why he gives us his Spirit. So that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We have substance that this world knows nothing about. Everything here is going to fade away. It's going to go someday because it's temporal. Mm -hmm. But we'll never die. We will continue for eternity because we are the substance of everything. He said, you look around at the natural and you'll see the substance of God. You'll see the reality of God in the natural. But it's pointing you. This is a shadow, but it's pointing you to the reality, the beauty of God. Right? The, the Sabbath day, though, the day that we set aside for God. Not that we can't do anything else, but we choose that day to say, I'm going to honor God today. I'm going to let people know, my family, whatever, that this is a day that I go to specifically worship God with a body. Yes. Now, it doesn't mean I don't think about God during the week or other six days, but I'm not in a formal setting with other believers all the time like I am on Sunday. It's a choice we make to identify yes. with the substance and not just the shadows. Yes. Praise the Lord. We can't afford to let those who only see shadows determine reality for us. That's what we're. That's what government does. That's what, what a lot of these issues that we're dealing with right now, people are trying to tell us what's real and what isn't real. Right. And they don't know themselves. Right. Why would I let somebody who only lives in the shadows try to tell me about substance? Come on. Right. Get some subs and think, come talk to me, and I'll be happy to sit down and listen to you. But as long as you're spewing this insanity that has nothing to do with God or with truth or with spirituality, you're wasting your time trying to talk to me about it. Yes. Amen. Amen. And I think, yes, I do get upset. I'm good, God. I maybe it's age, I don't know what it is, but I get pretty ticked off when I hear some of the craziness. And I have to remind myself that these people are insane. Yes. <laughs> I mean they are. You know the difference, the, the difference. Between a uh, you know a liberal and a non-liberal is when I they they can't understand that I can't understand them. Yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but that's the issue. They cannot figure out why I cannot understand or relate to their insanity. Yeah. Because you're a shadow. Yes. You're a shadow. You're not substance, friend. You may think you are, but you're not. Same time, we should be thankful for shadows and be grateful that a God who understands our limited perspective chooses to reveal his spiritual reality over and over again in his physical creation, as I said a few minutes ago. 
shadows that point toward his spiritual reality. In Jesus, flesh and spirit intersected. Natural and spiritual came together. Mm -hmm. Flesh and spirit, right? right. Re that reality combined, it came together for the first time. And that's why when we keep our eyes and our hearts centered on him and his grace, we have the best chance of keeping shadows in perspective. Nothing wrong with a shadow as long as I know what it's for. It's to point me to the substance. It's to show me that there's something going on here that I'm not seeing. The shadows are always distorted. You know, you know, you can have a shadow of somebody five foot tall if the light is right and shines in the right direction, they look like the nine foot tall. Yeah. So I'm not going to trust the shadow to tell me what that substance is. I want to see the substance. I want, I'm glad that there's a shadow because he can tell me there's something moving around here that I can check out. But I'm not interested in the shadow. I'm interested in what's making the shadow. What's the substance? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. See, there's, there's self-righteousness and then there's faith righteousness. Not the righteousness that I create, but the righteousness that God has given me. That's faith righteousness. It's the only righteousness that really exists, truly. Self-righteousness is a lie. It's a shadow. So for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. Just seven, verse six or seven. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. Amen. See, that was the problem with the old covenant. They were actually trying to make the excellency of the power about them. Right. You know, failing continuously over and over and over, but still acting as though it were true. And this is the beauty of it. This is the treasure that we have in earthen vessels in a human form, amen, that the excellency, this is weak, this is it, it's flawed, it'll, it'll fail, I promise you. Get me in traffic and watch what I can do. You know, get me in an awkward situation or something. I can be as crazy and as ignorant as anybody. Maybe more so, that may be my claim to fame. But that, the excellency, that's the reason for that is so that the excellency of the power is obviously of God and not me. Amen. Praise the Lord. So faith righteousness brings us into a consciousness of our relationship with God and not our performance for God. See the difference in the two covenants that we're talking about? Under the old covenant, it was always about me. It wasn't about me having a relationship with God. It was about me being like God, me being doing enough to get credit, to get uh, to, enough performance to get God's attention. Amen? The, the, the faith that is... Uh, Righteous faith, I should say, faith righteousness, it brings us into a consciousness of God and his blessing and his mercy and his grace. It's not about me performing anymore. It's about me saying, thank God, you came because I'm a messed up mess here. I'll, I'll screw things up big time unless you show up. Yeah. But the excellency of the power will be you and not me. Yeah. See, the, the natural mind is always going to try to define righteousness in terms of knowing good in order to do good, or knowing evil in order to avoid evil. This is what religion is. But think about it. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did. That was the thing that got them in the mess in the first place. Was if I know more about evil, I'll be better at avoiding evil. If I know more about being good, I'll be better at being good. No, you were perfect when you were innocent. You didn't know good or evil. You just knew that God's blessing and grace was upon you. And religion has been kind but see, that came from the devil, did it not? Right. And religion is still manipulated by the enemy. Yep. Yep. When Jesus was asked by a lawyer, he said, the lawyer said, what's the greatest commandment? They love commandments. Give me another law. Give me another rule to keep. What's, what's the big one? What's the big one that I have to do? Right? And here's what Jesus said. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now I've looked at that a lot of times. I thought, okay, now, but why all these, why all the laws? And what's he trying to tell us here? Jesus was redefining righteousness in terms of relationship, not in terms of requirements. Yes. That's what Paul described as the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. 
That's what Jesus was saying. This isn't about how much you can do. It's about having a relationship with God that will lead you into those types of relationships with other people. If you can love God and know how much God loves you, you can love others. You can be a blessing to others. But it's all about relationship. It's not about requirements. And we've made it all about the rule keeping when God has said it's about relationship. It's about you and me, just you trusting me that I love you and that you love me, even as awkward as it sometimes seems to be for us to love God. Once we start looking at righteousness in terms of faith and relationship, instead of keeping rules and regulations, a lot of other things start shifting too. Righteousness will always redefine sin for us. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what grace has done. Remember, we were so freaked out about sin and sinning and, and, and all this stuff for so many years. I know I was anyway. But Righteousness redefines sin. We define sin as legal violations instead of mishandled relationships. And that's not how Jesus looked at sin. That's why he said, here's the, here's the big deal. Love God. Have a relationship with God. And then you can have a loving relationship with other people. John, look, look at this in John chapter 16. Verses 8 and 9. And I want to show you again how Jesus is dealing with sin. How easy it is for us to pick up shadows and look at them as though they are the substance, when in fact they are nothing more than a shadow. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. We thought sin was going out and getting drunk. We thought sin was, you know, doing this or doing that or having one of these or not having one of those or behaving in a way or behaving in another way. But what I want you to notice here is Jesus was speaking of sin as a violation of a trust relationship, not breaking legal standards, mm -hmm. but a messed up relationship, a lack of relationship. Yep. The heart of all sin is unbelief, yeah. yep. it's mistrust, or neglect of a faith relationship. We need to live today with the substance of the knowledge that we are the righteousness of God through faith mm -hmm. and faith only. Mm -hmm. Not our efforts, not our works. We want to do good. We want to be good examples, right? We want to do the right. But that isn't what defines us. What defines us is our relationship yes. and our trust in God. Yes. Yes. Period. That's why we have no right to be proud or arrogant. Or as we said, it's easy to look at people that are just being nuts and thinking, my God, just burn them. You know, I mean, it's like the disciples. I mean, I almost feel that way sometimes. Can we just call fire down on this bunch and just move on? I'm sorry. But I mean, you know, we have emotions. It's the flesh. And what does that tell me? It tells me I'm not operating in the relationship with God that I'm supposed to be operating in. If I can talk that way, if I can feel that way or be that angry about it, I need to redirect my attention and my focus to my relationship with the Lord. Because yes. it's the only way I can love others. Yes. Galatians 5 and verse 1. I'm thinking about, I, just think of these two guys that were trying to break down an animal and they end up killing the guard and a nurse. Or I think she was a nurse. Too. Now, I don't know how long they were in prison for. I don't know if they were 10 years, 15 years, whatever it might have been. But they're there forever now. Because of one moment of stupidity. They wanted out so bad made themselves prisoners for eternity, or for at least for all of their attention for one life. I guarantee you they're, they're going to be locked up forever. They're, they're not getting off. This, this, there's no way out of this. For one moment. You know, it's insane. So I'm going to do another five years in there. 
you know, get out and I'll be done. Mm -hmm. I can start over. I can mm -hmm. have another life. I can, I can move forward. But no, I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. I'm going to take a hammer and beat him over the head with it and spend the rest of my life locked up. Never to see my family.
truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandments. Praise the Lord. Jesus had been he'd been dealing with guilt and shame all his life. I mean, not with his own, but with everybody around him. And what was his, his purpose was always to bring confidence that God loved them and not condemnation that he was going to get them or punish them if they would just reach out to him in relationship. Praise God. That in itself is great revelation. When you don't like the indictment that's passed against you, whether it's your own conscience or something somebody else is saying, we have the right to go to a higher court, to a court of appeal, with a greater judge, because God is greater than our hearts, and he refuses to condemn us. He'd be, he'd be breaking his own covenant if he did, and he, he's incapable of doing that. So when I feel guilty, when I get ashamed, when I get depressed, when I get bummed out because of some stupid thing I've said or got involved with or whatever it might be, I need to take that to a higher court. I'm not, I'm not the one that should be judging this. I need to go to God and he's going to say, I see no fault. It's cool. You're good. Amen. The court immediately above consciousness. Last scripture here. Look, look at John 21, verse 17. John 21, verse 17. Now let's look at this just in a little bit of a different context this morning. You know, Jesus, we know that John had, had uh, basically run out on Jesus. He abandoned him, left him, you know, uh, and ran away. And so Jesus, when he's resurrected, he tells the disciples, he said, I'm Go get, tell, tell the disciples that I've risen and tell them that I'm going to come to see them and tell John. He made a point. He said, make sure you tell John. Or Peter, I'm sorry. I didn't say John, but I meant Peter. Peter had, had abandoned him and so forth. So he constantly is telling them, now, let Peter know I'm expecting him to be there with everybody else. He's not done anything any worse than anybody else did. I, he's still a part of this whole deal, right? And he's trying to get him to understand it. So Jesus... Here he says, he saith unto him the third time. Now, this is the third time he's done this because, he, you know, he denied him three times, so there's a bunch of stuff going on here. But he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? Peter is feeling condemnation and has been ever since the moment he did what he did. And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. You really are the only one that knows my heart. And I, I do love you, but he uses a different word. Instead of agape, he uses another word that is less uh, intense. And he says, you know that I do love you, or I like you a whole lot. You know, he didn't want to commit himself because of what he had done. It sounded like he was a hypocrite on top of being everything else. He's condemned. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. He said the same thing to him three times. Amen. And Jesus had been trying to say to Peter during this whole thing, I know something about you that you don't know. I know you love me. I know it's awkward. I know you don't know how to express it sometimes. But you know, if I didn't know that you loved me, I would not be asking you to feed my sheep. 
If I thought you hated me, or if I thought you didn't have affection for me, or wanted to have a relationship with me, you'd be the last person I'd be wanting to reach out to other people. So he's trying to tell me, I know, I know you. I know your humanity. I was a human. I know how difficult it is to relate, uh, you know, to spiritual things when we're in the flesh and struggling with all the things of the flesh. He said, but I know that you do love me. So feed my sheep. It's all good. It's okay. <laughs> Jesus was trying to tell Peter, live not by condemnation, by the voice of a merciful God. Don't let the condemnation make you live your life a certain way. Live your life based on God's love for you, His mercy towards you, His forgiveness and His grace. And He said the same thing. done so much for him, and God is so faithful to him, even in spite of his flaws. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's hope for me. Yeah. Maybe there's a way that I could come to know this God in a way that he knows him, and that even with my flaws, I don't have to be perfect, but I can still love him and be loved by him and experience all that God has for him. That's the message this world needs. That's the message that Jesus brought. And we still keep playing around with shadows, trying to make people believe that that's the subject. That's the reality. Yeah. The reality is a loving, merciful God who wants nothing but your affection, your relationship, and to share his with you. <coughs> and all things are yours through Christ. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Resurrection morning next Sunday. Actually, every day is resurrection day. He comes alive in us the moment we open our eyes until we close them at night. And he's still there. Yes, yes. You know, watching over us and protecting us and keeping us. So go in confidence. Confidence in the Lord your God. Yes. That all things are possible with him. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Dismissed. Have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine. See you next week.